Can everybody hear me okay? I think this is the first time there's a microphone right about my level, so <laughs> Warburg, you're gonna have a little bit of a little bit of trouble. Thank you guys so much for being here at the Frank Batten School of Leadership and Public Policy to talk about the book The Partisan Divide. This book's written by two former congressmen, Tom Davis and Martin Frost uh, of Virginia and Texas, respectively. I'd also like to thank our sponsors. Um, FCG Consulting, a student consulting group that provides pro bono consulting to nonprofit clients. The Virginia Policy Review, a student organized research publication. The Jefferson Literary and Debating Society, founded on these grounds in 1825. And a special thank you to all the administrators at the Frank Batten School of Leadership and Public Policy who have spent countless hours putting up with me to make this event possible. Uh, a special thanks to you guys. Um, I'm going to introduce our two speakers, invite them up to the stage. Um, they'll give opening remarks and a presentation, and then I'll invite Professor Warburg up to the stage to open a dialogue up, and then we'll do Q&A after that point. At about one o'clock, food will be served, and we will also have books available for purchase and for signing. And before I forget, let me also thank Jean Marie Davis, because she carted all the books over here, so thank you. All right, so as an experienced former member of Congress, Martin Frost draws on his varied experiences to help pol public policy clients achieve their goals at the law firm Polsonelli. In his 26 years of congressional experience, Congressman Frost served for eight years as a member of the House Democratic leadership, spending four years as chair of the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee, and four years as chair of the House Democratic Caucus. As a result, he personally knows virtually every member of the current Democratic leadership and most of the ranking Democrats and key House committees. Additionally, nearly half of the current members of the U.S. Senate, both Democrats and Republicans, serve with Congressman Frost in the House. Congressman Frost appears as a political commentator on cable news networks such as MSNBC, Fox, and Bloomberg, and writes articles for publications such as Politico and The Hill. He was named a board chair of the National Endowment for Democracy in the spring of 2013 and serves as co-chair of the Circles Program for the John F. Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts. Next, Tom Davis served seven terms in Congress representing Virginia's 11th Congressional District. Davis was also chair of the National Republican Congressional Committee from 1998 to 2002. Today, he serves as director of federal government affairs at Deloitte where he continues to com his commitment to effective common sense solutions for government. Lest I forget, Tom Davis also currently serves as rector at George Mason University after joining the Board of Visitors at GMU in 2013. Uh, during his tenure in the House, Mr. Davis served as chairman of the House Government Reform and Oversight Committee, as well as chair of the Subcommittee on Technology and Procurement Policy. And under his leadership, the House Government Reform and Oversight Committee investigated matters related to the effective administration of government programs of great public interest. Mr. Davis also provided sponsorship of legislation giving the Food and Drug Administration authority to regulate tobacco and passage of the National Capital Transportation Amendment Acts, which authorizes much needed capital reinvestment in the Washington Metro system. Mr. Davis received his BA cum laude from Amherst College in 1971, and I think more importantly, received his JD from the University of Virginia in 1975. Please join me in welcoming the Honorable Tom Davis and the Honorable Martin Frost to the stage. Well, thank you. This should, this should be on. Can you hear me okay? So, uh, yeah, I was law school. My wife, uh, my, Jean Marie, was in the State House where she was Majority Whip and in the State Senate. And uh, she was a graduate here in uh, 1978. So she's a full who. I'm a half a who just going to law school <laughs> here. But the most important part of my bio is I left Congress after 29 years in office as chairman of the Fairfax County Board and as a uh, uh, member of Congress. I left. I left uh, a public office undefeated and unindicted. And I'm just very, very uh, proud of that. Yeah. So, uh, so Martin and I got thrown together on some talk shows. Uh, we were both campaign chairmen for our respective parties. Uh, me in 2000 and 2002, Martin, uh, four years previous that, we were both very successful campaign chairmen uh, picking up seats for our parties in, uh, in, in tough circumstances. Um, only, only three times in history as the, as the uh, president's party picked up seats in a midterm election in the House. Uh, Martin was chairman for one of those times, and I was chairman for, for a, another one of those times. So, you know, we, we had good strategic minds, I think, at least the record reflects that. Um, so I, I left Congress uh, after I was termed out as a committee chairman. 
Uh, we have a three-term limit in the House. It's just time for me to do something else. But I'm still a political junkie at, at heart, and I teach political science at George Mason, uh, where you said as I serve as, as rector. Um, Washington today is really uh, broken. Although the House passed the transportation bill that is not funded, but uh, they're, they're <laughs> but 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 they took they're taking some steps, doing some little things that used to be pretty routine things, like keeping the government open. This used to be pretty routine, like raising the debt ceiling. This was never never an easy vote, but never a hard thing. Now they're just struggling with some of the routine things and not very bold in, in, in a number of other things. And we can talk about that uh, in the question and answer. Um, but how broken is Washington? I'll tell you what, Dan Snyder put it really well a couple weeks ago when somebody asked him about the, the name of his team. Oh, you might have heard of them, and I hope I'm not offending anybody, but the team's called the Washington Redskins. And um, he was thinking about changing the name, the Washington Redskins, because he, he finally admitted the term Washington Redskins is divisive and it's polarizing, has negative connotations. So he was thinking of changing the name from the Washington Redskins uh, to just the Redskins. So, <laughs> so uh, this, is a, uh, this is a map of, um, well, I'm, I'm going to go one step further. The audience in a good mood just session. So <laughs> we were out at the opening game this year. I was up in the cheap seats, way up at the, at the, at the, in the end zone looking down. There was an empty seat on the 50-yard line, and it was empty at the end of the first quarter. It was empty at the end of the second quarter. So at halftime, if you've ever been to a game, I walked down about eight tiers. It takes you 20 minutes to get there to where the seat was. It was still empty. It was next to an elderly woman. So I tapped her on the shoulder. I said, ma'am, is this seat taken? She said, well, as a matter of fact, it's not. I said, would you mind if I sat here for the second half? I said, I can barely see the field with my binoculars up where I am. And she said, well, please, be my guest. I could really use the company. I said, I can't believe there's an empty seat here in the 50-yard line. I mean, these seats are scalping for hundreds of dollars uh, out front. And she said, well, that was my husband's ticket. She said, we had been to 30 Redskin openers together. She said, but he died. He said, but I know he would have wanted me to be here today. And I said, ma'am, I, I am so sorry. I said, couldn't you have found a friend or, or a relative that could have used the other ticket? And she said, no. Uh, she said, they're all at the funeral. So anyway, <laughs> all right. So how did things get as bad? How did things get as bad as they are? Well, Martin and I started discussing this thing and comparing notes, and although I'm a conservative Republican, Martin's a more liberal Democrat, we both were pretty centrist by congressional standards. Um, but um, we started comparing notes, and we thought we'd write a book about it. And so what we did is we discussed the root causes. This, this didn't just drop out of the air. Uh, there, are, there are three really macro causes for where we are today. And putting them together, it has made the political situation very polarizing and combustible. Here they are, Cause, root causes for polarization, or in political science, we call the ideological sorting of the parties. The first is the advent of the single party district. In the House of Representatives today, only 20% of the districts, maximum, maximum, are remotely competitive at the partisan level. Fully 80% of these districts are decidedly Republican or decidedly Democratic. Uh, by the way, the same holds true in the Virginia House and the Virginia Senate. These seats are very, they're made for one party. There are always a handful of seats that you can fight over, changing demographics and that are, that are fair fight districts. But by and large, the vast majority of these seats are one party seats. And what does that mean? That means that members are going to cater to who elects them. And if your race is your primary election, who are you going to listen to? Your primary voters. Problem is, primary voters are a pretty thin ideological slice of the electorate. It's not representative of the electorate at large at all. And Republican primary voters tend to be pretty hard over here. Democratic voters tend to be pretty hard uh, you know, on the left. So members uh, put their rhetoric, their attention, and their voting records to please their primary voters. And primary voters, by and large, don't like compromise. They want you to stand tough for principle and not bend and not cave, and we're right and they're wrong. And so you get a lot of that reaction. Uh, I, I was talking to some Democrats who were complaining about Donald Trump in Congress. I said, well, well, Trump, I mean, these are manifestations of what they go home to every weekend. And this is what they're hearing from their base constituents. It may not be the way you think or the va vast majority of voters, but the people that elect them, their primary voters, that's what they're hearing. Um, now, this didn't just happen out of the blue. Three, three causes of this. First of all, residential sorting patterns. People who think alike live in like-minded enclaves. 
Uh, so liberals tend to live in enclaves where people who think alike, they have a group speak that they go through and they all agree on stuff. Conservatives have the same thing. They go to the same places, they socialize with the same groups. There's a book on this called The Big Sort uh, by a demographer out of Austin, Texas, Bill Bishop, that describes this in some detail. Uh, but, but the fact of the matter is, uh, a lot of this map is decidedly blue and decidedly red and getting even more so. Um, there is the Voting Rights Act. The Voting Rights Act says you can't discriminate against uh, minorities when drawing districts, so it, what, what is, is led is to packing minorities into districts, and that bleaches the districts around it. The end result of the voting, when you're packing minorities, who are you packing? You're packing Democrats for the most part. And the end result of that is in the deep south today, in your, in your five deep southern states, and you can throw in Arkansas, all you have are white Republicans and black Democrats. And by the way, no need to talk to the other group because they play no role in your nomination process. And you have to ask yourself, is, is this really good public policy? Is this the way we want the country to grow up or you know, just running on, on uh, uh, separate planes of existence and not talking to each other? And of course, finally, is plain old-fashioned gerrymandering. And with the data analytics that are available today, uh, they can gerrymander districts uh, uh, pretty well. Now, if this were the only thing you could fix it, Ohio had a referendum uh, on Tuesday where the voters are now going to their state legislature and are making sure that's done by a bipartisan commission that will need a bipartisan vote to enact redistricting. Voters are starting to uh, rebel at this. We've seen the same in California. Uh, Washington State Martin will talk more about that. Um, but there are two other macro factors that have occurred over the last 20 years that have furthered the cause, if you will, reinforce this polarization. Uh, one are your media models. The media models today, it, it really started when the Federal Communications Commission did away with what's called the equal time or the fairness doctrine, where if you showed uh, one side, you had to show the other. Ronald Reagan went through this. If they showed his movies on the air, they'd have to show the other side, believe it or not. I mean, he got some really goofy decisions out of that, and they had to take mo Reagan's movies. If you like uh, you know, B movies, you couldn't see him for a while while he was uh, uh, running. Um, but there were some smart uh, media moguls who said, you know, we don't have to show both sides anymore. Let's build up a solid constituency that will tune in every day. We're going to feed them what they want. And out grew talk radio, cable news, and now you really see this now uh, on the Internet. Uh, the, uh, and, and the shocking thing is that like 50% of the people get all their news from the Internet, where the, what we call the crap to content ratio coming over there is exceptionally high. Uh, there are no filters on the Internet. Uh, this came home to me when somebody sent me Barack Obama's birth certificate from Kenya, and I got it over the internet, and it looked real, and I started to believe it. Somebody else sent me a birth certificate uh, from Indonesia for Obama. And so you start thinking at this point, where does this stuff come from? But people believe this stuff, and they forward it around, and uh, the, the social media it has transformed the way people receive their information, the facts they get. And member after member will come to me and say they go out to talk to their constituents, who are, are telling them that the Congressional Budget Office is wrong, that they're right, and they've got this stuff off the Internet, and people really believe this stuff, and it is added to the polarization. And, you know, for the news media, if you have ever watched Fox and MSNBC on the same night, th these are different planets. They're catering to completely different constituencies. These are business models. They are successful business models. Objective news, we can argue about that, but they're successful business models, and that's why they work, and people tune in to get their fix every night. But there's a third factor, and that's the money in politics. That has changed markedly from Mar when Martin and I ran our campaign committees. Uh, we used to be able to take this uh, soft money. Campaign finance, the McCain-Feingold bill, which both Martin and I opposed at the time, we, we said, well, it's great you're going to eliminate this soft money going to the candidates and political parties, but where do you think this money's going to go? You think it's just going to disappear? Well, what's happened is the money has moved from the political parties and the candidates Parties have been a centering force in American politics for 200 years because they have to be competitive for the middle to win. It's moved from the political parties out to the wings, to the to super PACs, to ideological PACs that play in primary elections. And so the money has shifted now from candidates. As a candidate, you have to raise your money in $2,700 increments at most. A super PAC can drop a million dollars on it and take a million dollar check from George Soros or the Koch brothers or, or somebody that's ticked off about something and go after a candidate. It's really not even a fair fight. Members live in fear of these groups coming after them. So when they rate, when, when they will rank a vote and say, we're going to score this vote, I've, I've heard members say, I, I don't want them coming after me. I know where I need to be on this issue. It is shaping the way uh, members of Congress behave and state legislators behave. It, it, I, I don't think you've ever had such a mess with funding after campaign finance reform 
and a couple of uh, court decisions. One, the, the speech now was a, a, a DC uh, circuit court uh, decision. And of course, uh, as we refer to up there, Citizens United. Uh, these two have shaped it and put this on steroids. So the, in, in many of these key races, the money's moved from the political parties and the candidates, they spend less than, than these outside groups combined. And some of this money is what we call dark money. It's not even recorded. Um, this is a congressional district, in case you didn't know. I'm sure exactly what the founding fathers envisioned uh, when they talked about uh, drawing congressional districts. This is a voting rights district in North Carolina. Uh, this is a congressional district, part of a Democratic gerrymander in Maryland. I'm not sure what that looks like. It's kind of an insect of some kind uh, running around. Uh, this is the earmuff district, a voting rights district in Chicago. It connects two Hispanic wings by a freeway. Uh, Gutierrez has that district. And if you ask him, he doesn't represent he doesn't represent areas, he represents Hispanics. That's his job. And this is what the district looks like, and it reinforces it the way the district is, uh, is uh, drawn. Uh, this is another uh, Democratic gerrymander in Maryland. I don't know what that is, but I will say, make this observation. If Picasso were alive today, he would not have to be, go through his blue period or anything. He, he could get the same level of artistic fulfillment by drawing congressional districts and probably monetize it better than he could uh, as a young uh, artist. Uh, oh, I like this, uh, this, is a Phil this is a Republican gerrymander. We're equal, both, both parties do it. Uh, this is, uh, looks like one dog kicking another dog, kind of. <laughs> but let me ask you this, does, does this pass the laugh test? Does this pass the laugh test? This, this stuff is out of hand. This is out of hand. I, I love the, what the Republicans did in Pennsylvania, not just because I'm a Republican, but because I always admire good politics. Uh, Democrats got more votes for the House of Representatives in Pennsylvania, U.S. House, in 2012 than the Republicans did. The congressional delegation was 12 Republicans, 5 Democrats. So that's, that's artistic. Uh, but that's the way this stuff gets rigged and gerrymandered. It basically takes the voters out of the equation, at least in November. N November in most of these districts is what we call a constitutional formality. Uh, because it's predetermined by the way these lines are drawn. I threw this in. This is a Virginia uh, Senate District 37 uh, in, in our area in Fairfax County. Uh, so it's coming to Virginia. It's coming to a precinct near you two. We have a bunch of Virginia districts. I didn't want to make this too Virginia-centric. Uh, so it's happening in state legislators, le legislatures too. And again, if you like artistic fulfillment or something and you want to monetize it, there's big money in this. Uh, it's another House district. I like this one. Another house district there. That's kind of, I'm not sure, but that's kind of a dragon. Um, along the way, the political parties' bases have moved. This shows over a 20-year period, this is a Pew survey, over a 20-year period, uh, the parties have moved apart. This is on government regulation. Uh, this is on stricter environmental. It used to be pretty bipartisan, moved immigration, all of these issues. Republicans and Democrats are very far apart, independent somewhere in the middle of between it but the party bases have moved to. This has is, this is reshaped the sorting of how people choose their political parties. This has led to the transformation of, of Kentucky, the Democratic state, or Arkansas, or West Virginia, solid Democratic states into Republican uh, bastions. Um, and vice, the Democrats have, have uh, done the same in Vermont, which used to be a heavily uh, uh, Republican state. Uh, we put, Martin and I put this together. Uh, this is, uh, we see voting today is we, what we say more parliamentary. Uh, people are voting the party, not the candidate. We have a chapter in the book called All Politics is No Longer Local. Um, and it, which, uh, you know, I hated writing it, having grown up in local politics in Fairfax County. Uh, but people come out and vote the party, not the person. This is a chart that shows in the last Senate election, uh, the, these are the Democrats that were up for re-election in 2014. The further right you, you go, the better Romney did. The further left, the better Obama did. Look at that, in the uh, Republican states where Romney performed well at the presidential level, and remember, this is an off year, not a presidential year. They states, even brand names like Pryor and Landrieu that had been around for generations, Democrats just, they just fell. People wanted a Republican. They didn't care about the person. This happens down the line in terms of how Romney performs until you get to Virginia. Mark Warner survived, barely, barely. And people are shocked, but if you understand the thesis of the book, it, you shouldn't shock at all. And as I explained to Mark, I said, Mark, uh, this isn't about you. This is about winning. This is about parliamentary voting patterns where people just wanted a Republican center and you weren't there. They like you fine, but they weren't going to vote for you. And uh, after, after um, Warner, you get the next two states in terms of um, uh, Romney, and Republicans took the seats in Colorado and Iowa. 
Uh, so Warner is the exception out there. And the closeness of that rate is less a reflection on him than it is just on the fact that voters are voting party. They're not voting for the uh, person anymore. In an off year like we just have, you get a little more ticket splitting. And the reason I was explaining to my wife, the reason is because the turnout's so low, you get a much more sophisticated voter in off years. Presidential years, you get people that come out of these high rises, they don't even know what county they're in, but they vote straight across uh, because they, they're motivated by the presidential election. That's why you get more coattails in, in presidential years. Now, this is a chart we put together. A, a National Journal looks at, at the voting habits of members of Congress uh, every year, and they rank, take about 100 votes, and they say, who's the most liberal member of the House? Who's the most conservative member? So, um, and they rank this every year. And so Martin and I went back 30 years uh, to see how has this happened. And we said, who's the most liberal Republican, and who's the most conservative Democrat in each Congress? Well, in 1982, there were 344 members in their voting records had a cumulative average that was between the most liberal Republican and the most conservative Democrat. That was 1982. By 1994, that had fallen to 252. 2002, it fell to 137. And in the last Congress, it fell to three. You have the complete sorting of the parties now in voting behavior, what VOK would call party in power. People are voting. And by the way, these three members are gone. Matheson, I, we, saw, we saw Matheson the other day. Uh, he's retired. Uh, McIntyre retired in North Carolina, and Barrow was defeated in Georgia. So uh, this is the, that, that's gone. Senate, you had 58 members in uh, 1982. It was down to 34 in 1984, down to seven in 2002, and the last three Congresses have been zero. The most liberal Republican has a more conservative record on the Senate floor than the most conservative Democrat. They may not talk that way when they're back in their state. But when you take a look at their voting records, according to National Journal, which we think is a pretty good source, that's the way it's been. Um, I'll try to move through this quick. This is what we call the blue wall. This is presidential voting habits over the last six elections. The blue wall, we call this, are the 18 states plus the District of Columbia that have now voted Democrat for president six straight times. That, that's a trend. And um, when, you, when you look at this, that equals 242 electoral votes the Democrats start off with if this trend continues. You only need 270 to win. So if the Republicans have an advantage the way the House is drawn, Democrats have uh, advantage the way the uh, electoral votes fall today. We have a chapter uh, in our book called The New Normals where we talk about divided government being the new norm and trying how do we adjust uh, to that. Uh, Republicans have their own red wall of 13 states, but it's only 102 electoral votes. So Democrats start off, I mean, for a Republican to win, they've got to carry Ohio and Florida. Uh, and so they, they have a much narrower path to win. Doesn't mean they couldn't win Pennsylvania, but if they win, if they were to win that, they win all these other states ahead of them. If, if, if the past is any uh, indication. Now, we put this up to say, okay, how do they vote in their Senate elections? And the answer is, in the Senate elections on the Republic of these uh, red wall states, it's a thir 25 to one Republican advantage. The only Democrat is Heidi Heidkamp from North Dakota, who won by less than one percent. Uh, in the um, over, over here on the blue walls, it's 32 Democrats and four Republicans, but three of those Republicans were elected in an off year, the most Republican off year since 1938, and are clearly at risk in Illinois, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania uh, in the next election. Parliamentary voting patterns. And so what happens is voters are voting in a parliamentary way, in other words, for the party, not the person. And when co members come to Washington, they behave, they react the same way. They act like it's a parliamentary system, which means the minority party is no longer the minority party, it's the opposition party. And they dig in fiercely. That's what happens in, in parliamentary systems. The problem is, as Martin will explain, we're not a parliamentary system. We're a balance of power system, and it just doesn't work very well. Um, for you Democrats in the room, there is hope. The, under, the undercard in the uh, next election, the presidential race, will clearly be competitive. but. In the Senate, the Republicans have seven seats up in states that Obama carried. Uh, six of these races will be competitive. I think Iowa probably isn't, uh, but the other will be competitive. Republicans uh, have a 54-46 uh, lead in terms of how people caucus, but Democrats have a real opportunity to take the Senate back. That'll be the undercard next year to the presidential election. That's the map of the United States by counties. This, uh, we just put this up briefly to show these green are counties that Bill Clinton carried in 1996 uh, that uh, Obama lost, even though Obama ran significantly ahead in percentages from what Clinton got. 
Uh, the yellow ones, on the other hand, are counties where Obamacare that Clinton lost. So we are seeing some sorting out of the electoral process along cultural lines. Democrats own urban areas, rural areas, strongly Republican with three exceptions. Uh, college towns, like Charlottesville, and, and you, know, you use the college towns, well, you know, the, you know the group speak you get here, and, and it just liberals flock to these areas. Majority minority counties, black, Indian, Hispanic, rural counties, still vote Democrat, and then what I call the granola belt. Uh, Aspen, Vale, Sun Valley, Idaho, where all the trendy, Tony, wealthy uh, folks uh, live and pretend to be cowboys. So uh, those are, the, the, but otherwise rural America is pretty Republican. Urban America, the largest uh, city that was carried by Romney was Jacksonville, Florida, 12th largest city, but it's really a county city. The, the city part of it, he, he lost. Second largest city would be Oklahoma City. I think uh, then Fort Worth would, Martin, which you represented would be the third, and that's also a huge uh, county city. Moving through this quickly, just to say, presidential races, by the way, are no longer national races. Uh, in the last election, only four states were, with, were, were um, as you can see, within five points uh, in the presidential race. Only four, Virginia being one of them. So you'll see a lot of that. These are not national races anymore. 84% um, of the TV dollars were spent in seven states. Uh, a presidential race is now an eight, nine seat uh, not nine state race, it's not a national race. Republicans, uh, Martin will talk more about this, have a problem. They're a basically white party in a country that is increasingly getting more diverse. Uh, since World War II, acting in a parliamentary manner, voters have generally not given parties third terms. Uh, we use this to, il to illustrate that um, in 1978, 80, the, the polarization of the parties has moved from 33% who liked their party and hated the other party to 65% today. The only thing Republicans agree on is they don't like Democrats. The only thing Democrats agree on is they don't like Republicans. Um, for those of you that are looking at the presidential polls and who's going to win with uh, Trump and Carson, uh, let me just go back and say if you go back eight years, it was President Giuliani at this time. Uh, things are going to move around a lot in the next two months. This means very little except for fundraising purposes in terms of who's on top today. Uh, on, if you go back four years ago, we had uh, President Newt Gingrich at this point was, uh, was, uh, doing, was doing very well. And uh, this is right after you had President Perry for a while. Uh, you had President Herman Cain. So this stuff really bounces around until these races start engaging about January. Um, you had uh, Hillary Clinton well ahead at this time um, uh, eight years ago as well. Think, things are going to change, so you don't push the panic button. I am, just by the, uh, full disclosure, I'm John Kasich, state chairman in Virginia. We don't worry about where the polls are today. You worry about where you're going to go and try to build an organization. Um, and you see it's an angry electorate today. Uh, you see 44% are angry, 28% are anxious and uncertain, and so anybody that thinks they know where this thing is going, but it's not a good sign. People are not highlighting Washington experience for the most part. Uh, they're talking uh, about how they're against it. People are upset with the status quo. Martin. I'm going to come around and speak from the podium if I can. Now, first of all, let me be clear. I'm Tom Davis' straight man. Um, he's, uh, he's a very engaging fellow, and he happened to have been a graduate of the law school from this university. I can't top that. Uh, when I was elected, in 1978, which was a number of years ago. Um, I'm, like many congressmen at that time, I moved my family from my district in Texas up to uh, the Washington, D.C. area. In fact, uh, my children, three daughters, graduated from Yorktown High School in Arlington, Virginia. Are there any Yorktown graduates? And I know Jean Marie went to Yorktown. Any of y'all went to Yorktown? Well, it's a good school, a very good public high school. Um, let me talk about solutions. And this is very important because what Tom set out is the reason why people don't talk to each other in Congress, why Democrats and Republicans don't talk to each other, why there aren't more bipartisan solutions. And it's because of this system that's developed in recent years and uh, where people are afraid that they're going to lose in their primary. They don't actually, not too many people are defeated in a party primary, but members of the House live in mortal fear that some well-financed, extreme person from their own party is going to run against them in a low turnout primary. And so what happens is they change their voting patterns uh, because they, don't, they like being in Congress. They don't want to lose a primary. Now, what can you do to make 
congressional districts more competitive and have a situation where the people in both parties will talk to each other once they get to Washington. One of the things that we've recommended in the book is that Congress pass a law, and Congress still does pass laws every once in a while, that Congress pass a law requiring all the states to have bipartisan commissions to draw congressional districts so that you wouldn't have these strange looking districts and so you'd have, you'd have more fair fight districts, uh, more uh, districts where both parties are competitive. Um, right now you have five states that have that. You have the state of uh, Washington, you have the state of California, Arizona, Iowa, and New Jersey. And the California uh, state has a very interesting wrinkle to that. They have a system where the top two finishers then run off against each other. It's an open primary, so you could have two Republicans in the final race, or you could have two Democrats in the final race. And if that were the case, then the two, re two Republicans have to go out and speak to Democrats on, in the general election, because it's whichever one can attract people in the other party. And if you had two Democrats in the final election, then they have to go speak to Republican voters. Um, this has mixed results. Uh, uh, no other state really has, uh, has adopted that. Louisiana has a variation of that system. And we'll see. States are the uh, laboratories of, export, of, of invention in this country. States often do things that the federal government then follows. So maybe this will catch on. Um, one of the other recommendations we made is to do something about the campaign finance system. This is central to having a more competitive political system in this country. And what we've had in recent years uh, is now you have all these outside groups. Some are called super PACs, which are candidate specific. And those super PACs can raise unlimited money. They can raise all they want from wealthy individuals, from labor unions and dues money, and from uh, corporations. But they have to disclose their contributors to the Federal Election Commission. There's another whole set of, of, of organizations called 501c4s, which are nominally social welfare organizations, which don't have to disclose their donors. And they raise millions and millions of dollars and often will come into a race, and you don't know who's putting up that money. And also, there is a, in theory, the candidate and these outside groups can't coordinate with each other. But there are no real standards here, and in fact, this coordination goes on all the time. You see this in the presidential race. Bush, almost all of Bush's money is now in his super PAC. Now, if you believe that that super PAC doesn't talk to the Bush campaign, um, I think you're, you're, you're way behind the times. Uh, there is coordination, and I want to read you something from our book. It's a very interesting book, and it's got a lot of interesting information in it. Um, and this is on the question of coordination between a candidate and these outside groups. And I don't know if any of you are familiar, there's a nationally known humorist who writes for The New Yorker. His name is Calvin Trillin. He's my wife's cousin, by the way, but that's not the reason I'm quoting from him. He's very well known, he's a very funny guy. And he wrote a piece for The New York Times several years ago once these super PACs came into existence. And this was a mock interview that he had with the CEO of a super PAC. And I'm gonna read it to you. Um, it's when super PACs were just getting started in, 19, in 2012, nationally known humorist Calvin Trillin wrote a satirical piece for the New York Times on the requirement that there be no coordination between a candidate and a super PAC supporting the candidacy. In the, in the piece, Trillin described a mythical super PAC, America the Super, set up by the mother of mythical candidate Jeff Gold, who was running for the United States Senate. Trillin interviewed the PAC chief executive on the question of coordination. Trillin. Well, you do understand the assumption some have that there might be more contact than the spirit of the law intends there to be, given your closeness to Mr. Gold, Super PAC CEO. My closeness? What do you mean by my closeness? Trillin, because you're, well, his CEO, because I'm his mother? Trillin, well, yes, because you're his mother. It's natural for people to assume that two of the two of you often talk, CEO. He never calls. He never writes. Now, <laughs> now. Then in 2014, this was written as a satirical piece. In 2014, there were four examples of this exact thing that Calvin Trillin described in, in his column. It said, during the 2014 campaign, we found out that Trillin, Trillin's mythical super PAC wasn't so mythical after all. USA Today reported on July 18th that Space PAC, a super PAC supporting the candidacy of Florida Democratic congressional candidate Gabriel Rothblatt had raised $225,000, all of it contributed by the candidate's parent, Martine Rothblatt. Also, the Boston Herald 
reported on August 6 that Shirley Grossman, the mother of Massachusetts Democratic candidate for governor Steve Grossman, gave $100,000 to a super PAC supporting her son's candidacy, Mass Forward PAC. Mrs. Grossman, 92, told the Herald, I believe in Steve. He's well-educated, honest, experienced, and all of the ideas he has are great. Candidate Grossman insisted that he had no prior knowledge of his mother's contribution. <laughs> and then, but this is bipartisan. Don't think this was just Democrats. On July 18th, the Washington Post reported two examples on the Republican side. According to the Post, Mike Turner, a candidate for Congress in a Republican primary in Oklahoma, was supported by a super PAC funded by $135,000 from his mother and grandfather. And then Ben Sass, who is now a, a member of the United States Senate, a Republican candidate for the Senate in Nebraska, was supported by ensuring a conservative Nebraska, a super PAC, funded by a $100,000 contribution from his great uncle, Rupert Dunklau. I'm his great uncle, and that's the reason, Dunklau said. Now, <laughs> we, we've suggested to you that maybe we should redefine the laws about coordination. I will tell you that when I emailed Joellen's cousin, Calvin, and said, I wanted to quote your column in the book, he responded, well, Martin, that's fine, but you know that I wrote another column, uh, and this one was about the, another column he thought was just spoof uh, and spoof, trying to be funny. After the shoe bomber, he said, well, the next thing you know, there's going to be an underwear bomber, and in fact, there was. Your point is, you can't make this stuff up. And uh, so we, we suggest redefining co uh, coordination. We also suggest putting limits, con uh, excuse me, uh, put, requiring disclosure for all the contributions made by these groups, C4s, that don't currently have to d disclose. Congress could pass a law doing that. Whether Congress would do it is another matter, because the people who are currently in power like the system the way it works. But it would be nice if we knew who was putting up all this money. Now, some of these people are such, so egotists that they tell you they're putting up the money, even though they're not required to report, but a lot of them don't. Now, interesting, the question of whether corporations uh, do this or whether it's mostly rich individuals. In fact, it is primarily rich individuals, although there are some privately held corporations. A classic example of why corporations are somewhat gun-shy for giving to these, uh, these PACs occurred in North Carolina a number of years ago when basketball great Michael Jordan was asked why he wasn't supporting the African-American Democratic candidate for the Senate against Jesse Helms. And Michael Jordan was, had just become the spokesman for Nike. And he said, well, you know, Republicans buy sneakers too. So corporations are a little less likely to put big money into these super PACs, although some of them do. So we would require a change in the coordination rules. We would also require uh, full reporting. Now, what else did we recommend? We recommended that um, all the primaries for Congress, House and Senate, nationwide, be on the same day. Now, not the presidential primaries. States could do whatever they want to for presidential nominations. But they'd be required to have their House and Senate primaries the exact same day. This would, uh, the media then would pay more attention to what was going on. There'd be a lot of publicity about all these primaries, and presumably you'd have a higher turnout. A higher turnout is good for democracy, and it also lessens the power of these well-organized, well-funded, extreme elements in a primary. Now, we don't know whether that'll happen, but it's a pretty good idea. We also recommended going back to a, a modified system that had been in existence for a number of years. This is called earmarking. Now, this is somewhat controversial. Not everyone agrees with us on this. Pr uh, under the previous uh, system in Congress, members of the House and Senate could specify how some of the appropriated money was spent. It only was about 3% of the total money appropriated, but specify particular projects in their district or in their state or even elsewhere. Uh, however, this was abused, and in fact, there was a congressman from San Diego, any of you all from California? The congressman Duke Cunningham from San Diego, who actually sold his earmarks. He took bribes, he sold them to defense contractors. Well, he was prosecuted in federal court, found guilty, and got, as he should have, and got to spend some time as the guest of the government in the federal penitentiary. But that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about actually specifying legitimate projects uh, that where money can, is spent in your congressional district or in your state, and the, we would not have let people do this across the board, but we would say it would be limited to 
your own state or your own district for a congressman, and that you would have to publicly disclose this. You'd have to have your name in the committee report saying that you were the one who requ requested this funding. Now, for any of you from the greater Washington, D.C. area, you, on the Virginia side, you know that the way to get to Washington, D.C., you have to cross one of four bridges across the Potomac. Well, some years ago, Tom Davis had an earmark to redo the Woodrow Wilson Bridge, which was about to fall down. And in fact, that bridge was redone, and now it's a much better way to get into D.C. than it used to be. A number of years ago, the business community in my city of Dallas came to me and said, Martin, Dallas is the largest city in the country that doesn't have public transportation. We would like to uh, have an above-ground light rail system. And so I got an earmark for, the, uh, uh, for Dallas to establish a light rail system. The, the DART system, Darius, Dallas Area Rapid Transit, is now one of the finest light rail systems in the country. So there are some very worthwhile projects. I'm not suggesting that they're all worthwhile, but as long as this is publicly disclosed, and limited to your own district or your own state if you're a senator, there really is nothing wrong with this. Now, why would we do this? One, because right now, Congress often, at the end of the fiscal year, can't pass the appropriation bills. So you have what's called a continuing resolution for a month or for three weeks, and this goes on and on. So Congress, congressional programs are not funded for the entire year. They're only funded for a portion, a portion of the year. And if you ran a business, you couldn't operate that way. You couldn't say, well, I don't know how much income I'm going to have for the first six months of the year. I don't know what my expenses are going to be, but that's the system that we have right now. And if you return to earmarks of the political parties, then would have a more leverage in getting appropriation bills passed in a timely way. And we'll see. We'll see if that happens. Tom and I have enjoyed this. We've gone around to uh, uh, seven presidential libraries in the last year. Uh, and made speeches. We've been on a number of university campuses like this. We've spoken before a lot of different organizations. And we're just one of a number of voices calling for change, institutional change in this country. We believe in our system. We believe in our democracy. We just want it to work better. And so we've made these recommendations. Uh, we've gotten some notoriety for this. Um, books will be available if anyone would like to purchase one uh, after the speech. And uh, we'll be glad to take your questions right now. Tom, you want to come back up here? And uh, we'll, Where you want to call him? Uh, we'll have, however you want to handle it. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll go to the chair if you want to have somebody call. Well, thank you both. I brought this here uh, because I think it's so important to think about these issues as we're making policy and, and what's going to happen uh, in America and in Congress. But I have one more person to introduce who's going to help moderate this. I think a whole lot better than I could. Um, so we're going to have Professor Warburg join us on the stage. He's going to open up the conversation, and then I'll be coming around with a microphone for anybody who does have questions um, for these guys. Um, Jerry Warburg is a senior lecturer at the Frank Batten School of Leadership and Public Policy and teaches courses on Congress, U.S. foreign policy, and advocacy strategies. Professor Warburg is a longtime congressional leadership aide, author of a number of works about Congress, and parent of a UVA grad who's now very active in politics. Please join me in welcoming Professor Warburg to the stage. Thanks very much. And, uh, I want to just very briefly say what uh, a pleasure it is for the Batten School to have these two gentlemen with us. Um, when I worked on the staff up on the Hill, we had a certain code uh, where we sorted the members. Uh, mostly it's just good people that you wanted to get in an elevator with. Uh, but uh, we're really blessed to have two men who are not only uh, honest and smart, but nevertheless optimistic. Uh, and they were chosen repeatedly at, at very early in their tenure by their colleagues to be their leaders uh, in the Congress. And we're delighted to have them here today at a School of Leadership at Batten. Um, Tom, of course, had been here many times. Tom was the first guest I ever had in my first class at Batten. Scared the bejesus out of some of my students about the challenges of doing stuff in Congress, uh, but has been a repeat visitor. We're delighted that his wife, Jean-Marie, is here, who's been a very valued member of our advisory board, working with us on a lot of issues as we have grown, and delightful to be able to welcome Martin Frost to grounds. Uh, I'm going to use the prerogative of the chair to throw out one quick question, and then I very quickly want to get to the audience questions, because you'll get some tough ones. Uh, they'll give you uh, some very good questions. The question I have is very simply, of all the stuff that you have worked on, and all the, the good and the bad and the ugly that you have seen, which of your recommendations do you believe is both most necessary and feasible? We disagree. I, I think the easiest one to do is you bring back uh, project designations or earmarks. Because then members have skin in the game. 
Uh, it's a lot easier to vote for something if you have a bridge or a highway or something you can go back. Um, and it, it is a leadership tool. But it's also the constitutional prerogative, prerogative of the Congress to designate projects. This is what happened the first 150 years of the Republic. <clears throat> Almost every project was designated by Congress. Somebody somewhere earmarks this money. It can be the local governments, it can be the executive branch, or it can be Congress. But by allowing a percent of that to go to members, you basically make it easier to pass bills. It brings a bipartisan spirit. And since they've taken them away, it's been much, much tougher. So I think that is an easy fix. A lot of members like it. Uh, a lot of our leaders on my side don't like it because the Tea Party went up on it. It, act, it doesn't add a penny to the budget. Doesn't add a penny. Your spending limits are set on what's called your 502 uh, A and B allocations. This just decides how that money is spent. And it's not always the most efficient way when you allow members to do this, but neither is it when you allow the executive branch to do Solyndra or local governments to do their projects either. And I, I, I think that the, the fundamental first change is the way districts are drawn. You've got to have more competitive districts uh, for the House of Representatives. You've got to have incentives for people to cross party lines and talk to each other. Uh, if you don't do that, almost nothing else can be done. The, uh, the funding issue is a very interesting and sexy issue, and it gets a lot of attention. The problem is that this is done, um, most of this is done by decisions of the Supreme Court. The U.S. Supreme Court has decided that money equals speech, and it's a, uh, protected by the First Amendment of the Constitution. So to change a lot of these rulings, for example, Citizens United, which permits corporations and labor unions to give unlimited amounts of money, you'd have to amend the Constitution, and it is damn hard to amend the Constitution in this country. So I think on the money issue, the best you can do is disclosure and also requires uh, le uh, less of this kind of coordination that happens. But I think if you changed the way districts are drawn, that would be the healthiest thing you could do. Excellent. Thanks for getting the ball rolling. I'm going to invite uh, questions from the floor. I would ask you if you would, just as a courtesy to our guests, uh, give us your name and your hometown and maybe where you are in your studies at UVA before posing a question. We do have a microphone since we're taping, uh, so please give a high sign to Brendan if you have a question from the crowd. Uh, and you might stand up also. Yeah, right, we, nobody gets chilly until we get a few questions. So. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, gentlemen, thank you so much uh, for, for being here. Uh, my name is Mark White. Uh, I'm from uh, outside of Memphis, Tennessee. Uh, I'm a second year uh, master's in public policy student uh, here at UVA. Um, my question is that there's sort of a fundamental, it seems to me, a disconnect in some of the complaints that we have about Congress where, on the one hand, we complain that they spend too much time fundraising, and on the other hand, we complain that their districts are too safe. And it seems that to me, that you'd, if your district is so safe, why are you spending so much time fundraising, and why do they all feel this compulsion? Um, I was wondering if you have some thoughts on reconciling those two. I'll start on that, um, because both party leaderships, this is both Democratic and Republican, uh, in, tell members you have to raise money for, their, uh, for our own campaign committee, the DCCC or for the Republican campaign committee, and you have a target you have to raise. In some cases, if you want to be a committee chair, you have to raise a half million dollars. If you want to be on a key committee, you have to raise $100,000. So members raise money into their own campaign committees, and then they contribute it to their party committees because their leadership has told them they can't be anybody if they don't do that. Also, there are some members uh, who are worried about a primary challenge. It's not just a general election, but if you think you might have a primary challenge, you're going to go out and raise a lot of money. By the way, my family and part of my family was from Memphis originally. Uh, my, gra my grandfather was in the liquor business when Prohibition came in. He left Memphis, and I went into another line of work, moved to Texas to go into women's clothing, and that's how that part of my family got to Texas. Yeah. Now, there is a lot of pressure if you want to go up the ladder to raise money for, for the team that they put into the swing. If you're in a swing district, I mean, money comes in. You don't control your own campaign because you have every group in the world, including the party, coming in as an independent expenditures. But more importantly, uh, in a primary, these super PACs play in primaries. And it drives the Republicans right and the Democrats left because they tend to be pretty ideological. So you've got to accumulate a fair amount of money to fend yourself off. And if you don't have money in the bank and your record isn't pure, uh, you have a big bullseye on you for these groups to come in, find a candidate, and, uh, to, and to come after you. So the, pre the pressure is still there, but it's more, more focused on primaries. And then you, you do have the per perhaps 20 percent members, maybe 25 percent in the Senate, that do have swing districts that need to keep a lot of cash on hand. The one thing I found out is by keeping a lot of cash on hand, uh, I would usually get a second-tier uh, opponent. 
because they said, geez, how am I going to get my first million? Uh, where you have to uh, raise uh, uh, hard money uh, to do it. So keeping that as a good insurance policy, if you don't have money in the bank, it's an invitation for some uh, gazillionaire to come in or some interest group to come in and ambush you. I think the best illustration of that, by the way, is what happened in Tom's district two years after he retired. Jerry Conley uh, won in 2008, but in 2010, uh, he has maintained in a presentation here at Batten uh, that over a million dollars in so-called dark money came in on Jerry's head at the last minute. He won by 912 votes, which I tease him about all the time. Landslide Conley. Yeah. Uh, more questions, please. A uh, whole bunch. Brendan, you're in charge of picking. <laughs> Hi, thank you for coming. I really enjoyed your talk. My name is Ashley Gobert. I'm a first year postgraduate MPP here at BAT and I'm from Virginia Beach, Virginia. And my question is, um, with identifying the issues of gerrymandering and then proposing these solutions, what steps do you suggest should be taken to kind of incentivize support of these initiatives with such a political divide? Like how do you, how do you rally people around these suggestions that you've made and getting congressional support and saying, hey, we should do these things when there seems to be more incentives to continue the gerrymandering versus the, to fix the redistricting, like, and yeah, things this, of those nature. Yeah, actually, this is a state, this is a state legislative issue. So you gotta talk to your state legislators. About it. We don't have an initiative uh, referendum process in Virginia. Uh, almost everywhere you have the bipartisan commissions, it's been done through the initiative process. Politicians are generally not going to change the rules uh, that they got elected under because they understand that and it works to their advantage. Um, the other thing I'd say is vote in primaries. In Virginia, it's easy. Everybody's a registered independent. You can pick and choose your primary. Primary participation is really low. And in Virginia, when we get the convention system on my side, it gets even lower. And, uh, you know, show up at these things because it's the activists, the, it's the hard liberals and the hard conservatives that show up to the nomination process and tend to dominate this field. And in safe districts, that's fine. In swing districts, it, it doesn't work because the voters tend to be more centered. So it has led Martin and I to the conclusion that liberals and conservatives have passion, but moderates have lives. And they just basically won't take a, a, a weekend out to, to go to a convention and participate and sometimes even vote in a primary. But it is interesting, uh, most people aren't aware that a lot of election laws are established on the state level. They're not established on the federal level. So that some states have what are called uh, closed primaries. You have to actually register as a Democrat or a Republican, and if, and, and if you aren't registered by party, you can't vote in your party's primary. And if you're an independent, you can't vote in either one of them. So if you're, if you, even though a plurality of the people in the country consider themselves to be independents, they are excluded from voting in party primaries in a number of states. In other states where they can vote, they don't bother to vote because they say, well, I'm not a Democrat or a Republican, I'm an independent. More people need to take part in the nominating process. And then the extreme elements and, all, and this money that pours in can't have as big an influence. Let's take, take another question, please. And, and uh, while you're finding the question, there are many uh, political observers believe that it would be Senator Davis if we had an open primary system for Senate campaigns in Virginia, uh, not Rector Davis. The Rector Davis has a certain ring to it. I'm in a, I'm in a better place. Go ahead. <laughs> Hi, Alyssa Smith. I'm from Detroit, Michigan, and I'm a first year postgraduate MPP. Uh, my Could question, you hold it up a little closer? Yeah. My question is about the change in leadership. Um, with Speaker Ryan, we were just speaking about this in Professor Warburg's class. Uh, he's He's using open rule now, and he has really he has really big hopes for bipartisanship in his, under his speakership. Um, and we just saw with the pass of the highway bill, even though there's no funds, it, it got pushed through. I was wondering if you guys are optimistic about him as a speaker and this open rule that he's attempting. Well, I know Paul Ryan very well. I have a very high regard for him. He's a very earnest guy. He's not a really political guy. I mean, he's he's not a uh, high political antenna. He's not a, really a partisan. He's a policy wonk. Uh, he, gets, he does well because he's earnest. You know where he's coming from. It's not blue jerseys versus red jerseys for him. It's about trying to get stuff through. Well, we'll see, but these macro uh, issues that are driving people apart are going to still give him problems within the conference when you have to get a budget agreement, and you've got a caucus uh, in the Republican side that is the hope yes, vote no caucus. They hope the thing passes and they don't have to vote for it so they can go home and pound their checks and not be part of what happens. I'll, I'll give you an example. Uh, in the TARP, the Troubled Asset Relief Program, uh, I was a whip for TARP. 
I didn't like it. It was a terrible bill, but there were really no alternatives with the economy spiraling down. I remember one member in the back room said, me and I hope this thing passes. I said, great. I said, we really need your vote. This is a, he said, well, I can't vote for it. I said, well, you just told me you hope it passes. I said, well, just, I, I hope it passes. It's got to pass. But I could never go back to my constituents and explain it. And that doesn't change, no matter who you are. But I think because uh, Speaker Boehner got the debt ceiling away and he got what's called your 302 uh, uh, allocations for spending for next year done, it will make it a lot easier uh, for him to have a successful uh, term, at least in this Congress. But those macro problems, problems. Now, in the next Congress, um, if you get a Republican president, it makes it a lot easier. The Republicans look so unglued right now because they don't have a president. You have all these different factions, but I, you, you take Barack Obama away from the Democratic conference, and they are uh, as dysfunctional as we are. And that's just the way the, the, the system works. So he may, he may reach a good stretch here, but these macro causes are still going to be a, a cause of concern. Yeah, let, let me just add one point. Uh, of course, I, I know Speaker Ryan, too. I think he's a very honorable, decent guy. We've had a succession of speakers, starting with Gingrich and then uh, Pelosi. And I'm not even going to talk about Hastert, because not, that's not relevant on this point. But, uh, uh, ha uh, Gingrich, Pelosi, uh, Boehner, and now Paul Ryan have all said, when I become speaker, I'm going to open up the process, and we're going to have more votes on amendments. None of them did it. N Gingrich didn't do it. Pelosi didn't do it. Boehner didn't do it. Now, Ryan really means this, and we'll see if he can operate the House that way, because if you open up the process and you have a lot of amendments in order, uh, those bills st stretch on for a long time. They were in until like uh, 1 o'clock last night voting on the bill because they let a lot of amendments be in order. So we'll see if he's able to do that. I hope he does it on a consistent basis. There'll be a lot of pressure on him not to do that because committee chairs are always worried that if you make some troublesome amendment in order on the floor and that they're made in order by the Rules Committee, the Rules Committee can either say yes or no on amendments, that somehow that's going to sabotage the bill. And so committee chairs come to the speaker and say, please don't make all those amendments in order. They're troublesome. I want to get my bill passed. So we'll see how he functions. Yeah. You've got to get a work product out, and open rules aren't, don't particularly help that. But let's give it a shot and see how far yeah, he goes. We'll see how it goes. Yeah. I'm going to make the following suggestion. I smell lunch, and we have a reputation for running things on time at the Batten School, and I know you guys have busy schedules. So why don't we take one more question from the floor, and then I'm going to invite folks to come up and, and, and greet the congressman to purchase an outstanding book. 10%, Tom. Where, where will uh, they be? Will the books be in the back? In the back, um, and to have an opportunity to engage with the congressman and also have some lunch. So let's take one more question from the floor, Brendan. Yeah. A lot of questions people wanted to ask. A tough decision. You know, you got good questions out there. Yeah, it's not tough when you got lunch waiting. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> well. Dangerous place to stand between students and lunch. Hi, I'm Kara Bautorf. I'm from Newark, Delaware. So from where? I'm sorry. I'm from Newark, Delaware. Um, and my question is I've seen a lot of graphs that go back farther than the graphs that you were showing and show that partisanship divide sort of used to be just as big as it is today. How do you guys respond to that, or do you feel like? Because a lot of the things that you brought up were sort of new developments that you think have caused the partisanship divide. So why did I'll, it I'll used to be it. so yeah, big? Is well, I, no, I mean, it, it's been 100 years before it's been like this. Remember this. You had one-party states. The South was a one-party, was, was, was one party, and liberals and conservatives fought out in, their, in the Democratic primary, and whoever won went to Washington. Uh, in the North, you had the same kind of one-party states there. And it was fought up. Uh, it was fought out in Republican primaries, and whoever won came to Washington. So you had a lot of conservative Democrats from the South. You had liberal Republicans. And when you got to Congress, the, uh, the parties were not ideologically sorted. Today they're ideologically sorted. This has been unique. This has been unique. Yeah, yeah. I think that uh, Tom said it all. Two, uh, two quick announcements before we, we break up. One, because I promised my friend, don't forget the chili cook-off Batten event later today, very important, uh, here in the amphitheater. Secondly, uh, uh, their former colleague and a Batten parent, is, we're delighted to announce, is going to be with us next week. Former Majority Leader Eric Cantor will be in this room at 12 noon on Friday, November 13th. Uh, please join me in thanking our distinguished speakers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.